All right, we are taping this a few days before it's going to run. So if the world ends or anything crazy happens, uh, don't blame us. Alexis Ohanian is here. Ohanian, Ohanian. I asked you before we went on. I've heard it pronounced so many different ways. I, you're one of those guys. It's like the I dated a girl whose name was Andrea, and everyone called her Andrea, and it was Andrea Andrea. Like what? So how do you pronounce it? Give it to me. Well, okay. Oh, Ohanian is what I say. I feel like there's a there's a much more Armenian way of doing it, which is like Ohanian, but I just say Ohanian, Alexis Ohanian. The thing I care more about is being called Alexis, not Alex, because <laughs> my name is Alexis, it's not Alex. And I was named after that guy who's out of view, but that's Alexis Arguello. And oh my God. Yeah. I was yeah. a huge fan of his. I, the the <laughs> prior Arguello fight was unbelievable. Oh, I that's it's a sensitive it's subject. It's a tough one. I know. Um, yeah, my father was really into fighting in the 70s and the 80s. And uh, Arguello was his favorite and uh, named me after him. Um, and it's, it's wild. And you, you, you grow up real quick <laughs> as a kid on the playground, as a boy on the playground named Alexis. And you really decide at an early age, if you're going to go all in on it, or you get people to call you Alex. And I went all in on it. And uh, so I'm very married to that. Uh, I'm quite proud of it now. But uh, it definitely taught me how to fight early as a, <laughs> as a little kid. I like the uh, the prior fight. I've now talked myself into prior was definitely doing something illegal yeah. during the fight. Like right they're spiking his water and all that stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, I know. And it's it, it's like and it's a wild thing, man. You know, he obviously had had such a, a, a difficult life thereafter and some pretty shady circumstances around his death. And, and just, you know, I think. um. I should ask my father again. I mean, he he felt like Alexis was such a gentleman and, he and a heck of a fighter, and you know, carried multiple titles and multiple weights. And uh, but he was a gentleman, and and it was one of those things that that was instilled in me. Like, okay, I guess that's the kind of guy I got to be. And then I had this moment, <laughs> talk about things I never would have expected, where uh, I was hanging out with Mike Tyson, and. I <laughs> and uh, I introduced myself, and he's like, "Oh, Alexis," and uh, and he was like, "You named after Alexis Aguayo," and I was like, "Yes, I am, sir." And he was like, "Oh, let me tell you, you know, he was he was an incredible fighter, and and it was such a gentleman." And I'm just like, "Oh, look, I'm so happy! Like this is this is what a moment, Mike Tyson! Oh my God, and my father! I can't wait to tell him the story." And he's like, "Yeah, he's a gentleman." He's like, "He was such a gentleman." Alexis used to just just beat the shit out of a guy. Like literally make the guy shit himself because he beat him so bad. And then afterwards, he'd be like, you know what? I hope I really hope you get better. I really I hope you're okay. And and would <laughs> would give him a good handshake. And I used to, and I'm and I'm hearing Mike, and that's my terrible Mike Tyson impression. And I hope I don't get uh, a phone call after this. But like it it was a moment that I'll never forget. And you should have heard me recounting this story to my pops because you know, you're the kid named Alexis, you're the boy named Alexis, and for years you're growing up defending this name and telling this story and retelling this story. And then Mike freaking Tyson tells you what an amazing namesake this man was. And uh, yeah, it just uh, blew me away. So yeah, as long as you call me Alexis, uh, <laughs> get some version of Bahanian, right? We're cool. Well, I remember when, uh, when, he, when he beat Boom Boom Mancini. Mm -hmm. And I remember really rooting for Mancini because he had his, his dad who was like physically failing in, in, the, in the crowd and, and Mancini just wasn't good enough. But then afterwards, mm -hmm. Arguello felt worse about it than I think Mancini did. You know, his, his arms around him, he's consoling him. And it was, yeah. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And, and I'm, it's, it's those little moments. And I, you know, my, I remember my dad having this collection of VHS tapes that he would sit me down and make me watch on the VCR of these Arguello fights. And uh, it's wild because that's how boxing was introduced to me as a kid at a time when so I was born in 83. So by like early 90s, you know, my dad's really leaning in on boxing. And we're uh, at this point, we're solidly an NFL household. Um, were you growing <laughs> up at this point? Uh, so we had left New York when I was about six. So we moved to uh, Howard County, so outside of Baltimore, Maryland. But it was after the Colts before the Ravens. So it was a Washington football team household. And my dad, had, my dad had spent some time in College Park. And so he, was, he knew the area well. And he was a, a DC sports fan. And in particular, uh, the Skins, or the team formerly known as uh, the Skins. And um, you know what, what had drawn me to fighting and trying to like understand this was, was it was through his eyes. 
because at the time, right in the early nineties, boxing had just changed so much as a sport and, and the dynamic and the, the, just everything about it was just so different. And, and it's been tough too. Cause like, I know, like I'll still catch up with my dad about it and he still tries to follow. He's definitely not a UFC guy. He has not made that transition. He still just wishes boxing were like it was in the glory days. And he tells me about, he tells me about the Ali flight, Ali fight he got to go to when he was a little kid with his dad. And he tells me about these moments and, and memories that he had. And it's, it's interesting. I, sometimes I do wonder where the future of some of these sports do end up heading. Cause like at the time, no one would have expected boxing to sort of be where it is today. Cause it was such a big part, culturally relevant, such a big deal. Now it's like, Oh, Hey, you know, you're a YouTuber. Uh, you can get into, a, uh, make some good money having a fight with someone and, and no disrespect, but it's just very different. And, and sometimes I wonder even to now with like the NFL, you know, growing up, that was a Sunday religion for us. And, and I just can't help but wonder if in 30 years, 40 years, I have a very different relationship and people have a very different relationship, even with a powerhouse like the NFL, just because enough people are like, well, we've moved on. We're to something else. Who knows? Um, but I, it just, if anything, it taught me not to take anything for granted because I, I, I know the role that boxing had in his life and his childhood, and you just could never expect it to go away. And, you know, it's a shadow of its former self. Yeah. And, uh, you know, no, nothing is, nothing is for certain. These, these things, um, it's, uh, they ebb and flow like, like business cycles, like everything else. It's funny because in, in one sense, it's still successful, right? The pay-per-view is doing well. They're selling the right stuff like that. But, you know, I was thinking about it when, when Hagler died, that mm-hmm. was when you really, you, you know, that was like one of the biggest, 10 and a half minutes of my life. It was such an important fight. And then it was so far exceeding the expectations what anyone had. It's still the best fight I've ever seen. But just mm. in general, having that division with Hagler and Hearns and Duran and Leonard, and it just was really meaningful. And anytime there's a big fight, everything stopped for weeks, yes. even before the fight. And you're right. That's, that's just probably not happening again. And I mean, it's, it's wild to see the incarnations of it now with social media fueling it. And, and it's, it's very interesting. Um, I don't know. I, I, I really, uh, I wonder, cause I, <laughs> when I think about the purest type of sport, when you really whittle it down, the idea of two people one-on-one with no one else, right? There's only a handful of sports that give you that kind of pure, like one-on-one who is the best. And, and there's fighting, there's tennis. See, so I brought it back and, okay. and not many others. And this was something, dude, as the kid who played soccer, uh, although I am fond, fond of calling it football, but as a kid who played soccer growing up, as a kid who played football and basketball growing up, team sports. Um, and that was the only thing I was in, <laughs> it was like sort of indoctrinated into. Um, I, I used to think that was a country club sport, tennis. I mean, I, I mean, it is technically, um, but I had no respect for it as a sport because I was so naive and there are, there are a few out there that are so just 1v1 who is the best um, and so mentally taxing as well as physically taxing because you, you don't have a team out there. And it's, I don't know. So I like to think I'm, you know, I, uh, we'll see what Olympia ends up doing. But every time um, she messes around on that tennis court, uh, it's, it's exhilarating to watch. And uh, I, I ended up, I selfishly named her, well, my wife and I named her after me. <laughs> so she's Alexis Olympia Ohanian Jr., um, so I, I don't know. I didn't become a boxer like my namesake. Maybe she won't become a CEO, a tech CEO or an investor like her namesake. Um, but whatever it is, hopefully it's a, it's a good time. Yeah. The way you described boxing was when mm-hmm. I was growing up tennis, like Borg versus McEnroe was as important as any other thing that was happening. And it's, McEnroe was my guy and yeah. I was just so into it. And, uh, and now I feel like, like looking at your, your wife, Serena, mm-hmm. She, it's a little like how we felt with golf with Tiger in the late 2000s where mm. he, when Tiger got hurt, even before the car crash, when he got hurt and he was out of year, you kind of look around and you go, wait, I don't care about any of these people. What happens? And Serena's been around for so long and, she, and at some point just became the measuring stick for everyone else in women's tennis. And you watch a tournament and your first reaction is, where's Serena? Is she still alive? How'd she do? Yep. What yep. round? Is, what round are we in with her? And it's like the tournament hasn't officially started until she's been challenged. It's mm-hmm. going to be so weird when she's gone. Mm-hmm. They don't, they don't even have anything close to whoever the, I know some people would say Osaka, but I, we just don't have the 
lineage with her yet. So, sure. you know, I think it's really rare to get to that point in any sport. Dude, it's it's next level. And and I appreciate you said, I can't remember. I watched the thing you did a year or two ago about Serena. And I was just like, my guy, like I, I loved it. And you know, I'm, I'm pretty out there on, on, on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> I probably should, should watch my mouth more often, but I just can't help myself sometimes with some of the commentary and some of the bullshit that I see. But on the whole, um, I mean, obviously I agree. Um, but on the whole, I think what's so telling is, and I think the tiger comparison is an apt one, especially in America, right? These are, this is a sport tennis that is not at the forefront of a lot of Americans' minds. But when it is, it's usually because, and I'll, I will mean, put both Serena and Venus in there. Like these two women, these two black women went into a sport that didn't want them, that did everything they could in a lot of ways to keep them out, to keep them from being successful ever since they were young, young women, girls, and overcame it and, and made... I mean, captured the attention of the whole world, but in the process, like, yeah, I mean, you know, the U.S. Open is, you can see it in the ratings, uh, right? The, the people that America wants to watch, the stars, the greats, right? It, it, there, there's a ton of amazing people playing tennis right now, um, but Serena and V have made it relevant for, for us in particular, as well as, as well as the world, in a way that's, that's remarkable. And I, I don't think anyone will fully appreciate until one day when they retire, which won't be anytime soon. But, but when they do, I think then we'll finally get uh, a little bit of perspective on it. But, uh, but look, I'm, I'm enamored with the fact that it's opened up the door for so many amazing talents, including Naomi and so many others that uh, it's great, man. I, and again, I say this as someone who is a total bandwagon fan of the sport. I yeah. never watched a match until 2015. Uh, when we started dating, but uh, it's it's something fun, man. It's wild to see. You yeah. know, I think you look back at like the career, which has been twenty years now. That first decade, I think the dad, you know, he was he was kind of his generation's Lavar Ball in some ways, where mm -hmm. he he mm -hmm. was talking a lot, and the media instantly was like, "Who's this guy?" So you had that. Then you had the sister versus sister thing, which. I still feel like you would watch those matches and you were like, are they really, are they a hundred percent trying to kill each other in this? Like there's so much love between the sisters. Like how competitive is this? And there were all these rumors about, Oh, they let her win that one. And then she gets to win the next one. Yeah. And I, I don't feel like it was till the beginning of the 2010s that people really started to be like, wait, holy shit, what's happening here? And I remember I went to the Olympics in 2012 mm -hmm. and she, we saw her in person a couple of times. Mm -hmm. She destroyed Sharapova. And mm -hmm. there was some back history of that. Cause Shara it was which one? Wait, which time which which of the times she's destroyed Sharapova are you referring this, to? This was 2012 Olympics. Yeah. Okay. All right. I and got there it. was that backstory of Sharapova beat her once. And since then, Serena would have a little extra every time they played. But to see it in person mm. was it, the the two best things I saw that in two weeks, I went to everything, was Usain Bolt. And Serena destroying Sher Sharapova. <laughs> Those are honestly the two best things I saw in two weeks. It was just like clear, like wow, this is somebody that's not coming around again. But now you know we're in the we're in the twilight, and she's got a family now, and the whole thing. And it's like, how much longer does this go? And it becomes that old question of when does the athlete know? Dude, I you know I can't. I have no answer. I have no idea. I'm I'm here supporting. You know, in the same way. She's a ceaseless supporter of my career, and she she puts up with a lot more uh, than I do for sure. Uh, but uh, I, you know, I think this is this is something only she is going to know, and only she is going to answer. And at the end of the day, um, I just continue to be in awe of everything she does and continues to do. And and again, I like I don't know. I also had to look at this whole thing with fresh eyes because. So like one day I'm on Twitter and someone tweets at me highlights from a match. Hold on. I think it was with Capriati. Oh my it's God. The app that invented Hawkeye or, or created the demand for Hawkeye, right? And, and I'm the tech guy, right? I've invested in companies like Cruise, which is a self-driving car company. Now it's a multi-billion dollar company. When it was just a couple of founders with an idea saying, we're going to make a self-driving car. I said, here's some money. Let's help you build it, right? We have cars that can drive themselves. And this was... I mean, five, six years ago, and this technology was just getting started. Calling a ball in in real time 
is trivial. And so I'm going to all these matches and I'm like, why are there humans doing this job? Yeah. And someone's like, oh, because it's tradition. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, but wait, you can challenge the call and then they can use the technology they know they have just to make sure the human got it right or wrong. Like as a technologist, I'm looking at this and as a sports fan and I'm like, why would you take a sport that's potentially perfect? Because like, I can't explain to my daughter what a catch is in the NFL. I don't actually know how to define a touchdown catch anymore because there's so much nuance and subjectivity. And, and, and every other sport has these dynamics, whether it's flopping or pushing off or travel calls, right? Things that I'm, but tennis has the chance to actually be pretty damn perfect because it's just, you know, very simple rules and some boundaries that a computer can actually tell you about. And, and I was so delighted, what was it, this past tournament in Australia because it was fully, it was robotic, right? It was Hawkeye doing the, the calling in and out. And so there's no subjectivity. And so I'm complaining about this on Twitter. And yeah, someone shows me this clip of this, it was Cap, Capriati match. Yeah. And I'm watching these and I'm just like, how is no one saying anything? How are the commentators not saying anything? Like Serena is getting clearly balls in that they're calling out and, and vice versa. She's getting all these calls against her. Like, this is absurd. Like the, you have one job <laughs> and you're messing it up and it's very clear. And I, um, I got to relive this thing that, you know, I was years and years late to this frustration that all these fans were feeling and have been feeling for a decade plus. And, uh, and it also tapped me into just how much, how much more there is to her matches than, than just the win or the loss, right? There's a whole, whole, there are people all over this world who watch that and see some part of them in her struggle, who see some part of their pain in, in the injustice of those calls. I mean, you watch this and you're just like, how this is, how, it, it feels borderline criminal, especially in a sport where the rules are so clear cut. And, um, and that's, I mean, I guess that's, I think that that layers into so much of what, she and her sister have done and overcome and gone through. And it's, it's awesome. I'm, I'm, I, you know, it, it's, it's the kind of perspective that I, um, I know, uh, Olympia is going to have just through those, through those tapes, through that footage. Right. I mean, Olympia will have some memories of, of her mom playing, but she's, she's already, she's three now. Um, but, uh, but there's a whole legacy of conversations and memories and things that, you know, Serena's going to be able to pass on to her that will be exciting and uh, and pretty inspirational to to have a have a seat to. And you know, I'll tell my great war stories from building tech companies and whatnot, but I uh, not quite the same. Right. Not well, I hope I hope the story you just told about replay review will be talking about the NBA like that in 2040. We're we'll like, oh man, remember when the NBA was just completely off the rails for five years with replay <laughs> reviews, and and then we had a rebellion, and then finally they fixed it. Do you think is that is there actually a path to that? The NBA is the most progressive league, and it feels like the one that's going to you know get it right sooner. But the annoying thing about it is they'll spend five minutes on one call, mm -hmm. but then there will be another call, and they'll review it, and something clearly happened in it, but they can't review. Like I was watching a Celtic game yesterday, mm -hmm. Jalen Brown. They reviewed for a hostile act; he got hit in the face, but mm -hmm. he didn't shoot a free throw because they missed the call. So they look at it and they're like, "Yep." Yeah, no hostile act. It's like, well, what about the free throw he should be getting? What is, what is the point of this? Yeah. I, it, it is, it, it, we're, you know, every industry is wrestling right now with technology <laughs> because it's like, it's changing every single thing we do and including sport and the way we play it. And, and this is incidentally why I think this is actually one of the best times to be investing in all things sport. Mm -hmm. Not that I have a sports-based venture fund, but my venture fund is... <laughs> it's called 776 because 776 BCE was the year of the first Olympics. And though it's not a sports tech fund, uh, I just really liked the symbolism of going back to that first starting line of you know the, the paragon of competition. Uh, and, and dude, this pandemic showed it though because it... I know people are going to talk to the viewer numbers that were down, although the NWSL was higher than I think every other pro sport last year, um, that they're looking at the wrong numbers because television consumption is not the metric for engagement in 2020 or 2021 for that matter. Um, social media is where these conversations are happening, whether it's listening to a podcast, whether it's chatting with your friends on some uh, subreddit, whether it's just even the group chat or all these new platforms. What about I, TikTok? I mean... Dude, 
I, I feel I mean, like eyeballs have drifted t- away from TV to TikTok. That has to be a factor. Dude, it, it is it is 100 percent I mean, you can Quibi versus TikTok is the story of, I mean, that's the story of of not just last year, right? Billions of dollars invested in a platform with the best actors, the best writers, the best everything, and gets eviscerated in months by teenagers doing dances. And why? Because you can't compete with the creativity of millions and millions of billions of people when the entertainment you're providing has that as an alternative. Like that two minute short or that five minute short on Quibi is fighting for five minutes of attention on the bus with the infinite feed of highly recommended tailored content from the world. And that's, you're not going to win that, right? No matter how funny that comedian is, no matter how great that script is, they're competing against the world, the hive mind. That's, that's not going to win. But sport is the type of entertainment where all of that content, someone reliving the, uh, the, the, Kevin Durant dunk. I got to show my Nets bias here. Um, show, someone recreating that great play in their backyard is not a replacement for the league. It's just an enhancement. It's one more reason to remember to watch when the next game is on. And so social media is actually a, a great benefit to sport, unlike every other form of entertainment where it's actually a competitor. Uh, because sport has a monopoly on attention. There's still only that game that you have to make. There's only one championship a year. There's only one winner of every game, right? There's, there's objectivity and there's scarcity. And, and so the story of all these things, and frankly, a lot of the investing I've been doing is, is, has been highlighted by this last year that really shows that in a world that is getting increasingly more tribal and fractured, which has a lot of downsides to it, but, but is what sport does so well, right? It, it artificially creates tribes that we bleed for and care so much about, even though they're totally made up. Um, and, and it captures our attention uh, and creates community in ways that no other form of entertainment can. And I think it's just, you know, these, these leagues are still so out of touch with technology and improving the user experience and everything else that there's just only upside from here. And, uh, and I'm excited, man. It's... It's going to be a great... The next 50 years will be an amazing time to be a sports fan. Well, and it also looks like the way we're going to be consuming this stuff is going to start to change. You can feel it even with Amazon trying to get NFL rights and stuff like that. And then, you know, I think we're headed to a future where you're going to be able to pick your announcing team. I felt like this was going to happen five years ago, but now I really feel like it's going to happen. You could have 20 different announcing team picks Um, as you're on Amazon's NFL uh, season ticket thing. And um, it'll be way more inclusive and way more trying to capture people like my son and basically the narcissist generation. These people who are like, who are (laughs) like, hey, I want in. I I know I have no credentials, but uh, get me in there. Bill, I'm going to spin it for you. I, I agree. I do think... There is something really special. This generation, the narcissist generation, the digital native generation. The selfie generation. Selfie generation. They're the first generation to think of themselves as much as creators, as consumers of content. And that's powerful, right? We used to watch a movie and we'd be like, that was a good movie. And maybe we'd, we'd bullshit with our friends after and be like, I would have done this differently, maybe. But this generation can watch the movie... <laughs> And actually remix it and make it better and upload it and actually have that remix, whether it's a movie or a song or artwork or whatever, be better. And, and, you know, even when they're editing silly videos on TikTok, they're using pretty impressive editing techniques. They are interpreting culture and content with the mindset of, I can create something even better, which is really empowering, right? It's like, you know, when you're listening, let's see, when we're suffering through Joe Buck on an NFL broadcast. Is he still doing NFL? I don't even, I can't even listen to any of the stuff with the sound on. And I don't know if I'm going to get He's still name. doing it. No. He, he, you just heard his feelings. Yeah. I, <laughs> but like, it, I, we, our generation, we were stuck suffering through that, but our kids are going to be able to, I think to your point, not only will they be able to choose from 20 different announcers, they'll be able to choose from a thousand and more than half of them are going to be randoms just in their dorm room, right? They're going to be homegrown. They're not going to ever have had a talent agent. They're going to have interesting accents and interesting backgrounds and interesting opinions. And there'll be people doing voiceover work who never would have gotten a job at Fox, who are just going to spend the entire time talking about, I don't even know what, like they'll have, they'll just cover the entire game um, themselves 
through just random anecdotes and jokes, right? They won't even be talking about the game that's happening. Yeah. And that absurdity is, is exciting, right? That absurdity creates the potential for new talents to surface. And, um, and I even, I don't know, I, I, I like the fact that I, I mean, I gave you a, a sort of silly example, but there are people who absolutely geek out over this stuff whose commentary, because they are so expert, is delightful to listen to. Like I, I enjoy hearing folks who are not there to like talk down to me or talk to the like lowest common denominator of viewer, but actually like really going to indulge on all the subtleties and the nuance. Like baseball, there is... Oh my gosh, hold on. What's this guy? Uh, hold on, I'm going to find him on Twitter. There's Talk about a, John Boy? John Boy. There we go. Yes. Okay. So like John Boy does his videos. I... Not a baseball guy. Like I, I'll watch some games with some buddies. Like I'll go for the social effect, but I'm not. I'm not here, you know, tracking every box score, and and listening to his VOs, watching his commentary. I'm like, oh wow, there's a lot more to this game than I ever realized. And and it was just because no commentator on Fox or whatever network had ever been creating content for this audience because they were you know trying to entertain or they're trying to do something else. So I think it's good, man. Bring on the narcissist generation of creators. Well, you're just, life is hard and it's not all about them, but <laughs> right. Well, you created, um, Reddit, what was it? Oh, six. Oh, five. Oh, five. Yeah. <laughs> so that crazy. And at the same time, the blogs are starting to kind yeah. of rise and you yeah. had this whole generation of, we, especially like, just think like sports and culture. We mm -hmm. had people in newspapers, maybe some people who wrote for mainstream websites and those were all the critics. And mm -hmm. Some of them weren't good. Most of them weren't good. But then you had this new generation, like what you're describing, of these people who were just really good at hyper-focused stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. the best possible Celtics blogger. You go to some Red Sox message board mm -hmm. and there's three people on there and they know more about the team than basically anybody you're reading. Yeah. And for all the downside that people attribute to some of this stuff, and look, like I think you could argue Twitter is probably the worst thing that's happened in the last five years, technologically. Um, <laughs> there's still some good stuff too. And I, I feel like I got to know my teams a lot better from a lot of the stuff that started in the mid two thousands. What did you see? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I know you've told the story a million times, but what I was looking at this stuff, like you're looking at pieces of turf, right? Like you just, what mm -hmm. you just laid out now about, I saw opportunity in sports the last year. I, I see a piece of turf I want to grab. Mm -hmm. What was the turf you were looking at at 0405? It was, if you can believe this, back then in 2004, the, the front page of the New York Times was the most important news of the day. Maybe CNN.com, but really it was the front page of the New York Times. That was the news of the day. Now you ask yourself from first principles, why? Well, because it had always been that way, because for a hundred plus years or however long, that was the institution that had invested all this money in, you know, doing great journalism and, you know, providing international broad opinions, thoughtful analysis, all the great stuff. They built a brand, they built a legacy and, and people like my, my dad were like, yeah, I got to have a New York Times subscription because that's how I know what's going on in the world. And that was, that was it. And there, there was frankly... There was competition, but there wasn't a ton of competition, but there was competition. Um, and they were the one, and that was the front page. And yet, right around this time, blogging was starting to happen more prominently. And it was clear there would never just be one front page for the internet. Or if you were to build one, it would have to be really agnostic. It couldn't just be one newsroom's take because the internet was clearly so big that the definition of a front page for you, Bill, was just different than a front page for me. And yet the entire model up until then was some gatekeepers saying, this is the most important news of the day because it's on page one of our newspaper. And you can pick on any of the, the large publications at the time. And it just that it was obvious that would not scale. And what we needed to do was build a, a system inspired by web forums. Like I ran a PHP BB forum in college that I had started, you know, a few hundred people just talking about politics and news and stuff. And, you know, message boards have been around since the start of the internet. And, and what was our way to build something that was a more modern, unified place for people to come and share links they thought were interesting, share photos, start discussions, and then comment about them. And, and the commenting, which our, our initial investor, Paul Graham, tried to talk us out of. And I was like, no, we need comments, um, which are now like everything. 
uh, and really drove so much of the great the greatest content there comes from the users who are creative enough to express their ideas and you know they invented the ask me anything they invented so many types of content that now are on the internet pretty widely it's just some random user with a good idea and I think that was the thing that we caught at the right time and certainly you know there are things I think we could have executed on better I know I could have executed on better um, over the years but uh, but that was the opportunity now and or then and now like we've just gone through the first wave of social right there's a generation Gen Z that's grown up digitally native using these platforms over the last 10 15 years and this is bringing about a second wave of social our our and it's it's a lot of it is a reaction to the first wave and the missteps and the mistakes that we made. So, like the first investment we made on seven seven six was a company called Dispo, which is basically a, a, a sort of an alternative to Instagram. Instead of spending, I'm mean, gonna imagine you can go out safely and spend instead of spending your night taking a thousand photos with your friends and photoshopping them and making them perfect and choosing the perfect one to post. Um, Gen Z wants to just take photos and not look at them. Uh, you can't actually see these photos until they develop the next day. And so you're living in the moment. You're not living on your phone. And then you, you socialize the next day with your friends online. And, and if you're thinking differently about how to build a photo sharing app now in 2021, you're not trying to make people chase likes from people who don't actually care about them. You're not trying to create the, the, the environment where things like bullying are so much easier. Um, and I'm, I'm excited for the second wave because I think it's going to be way more thoughtful and just way healthier and way more fun and, and better. Uh, because we've, we've made, we made enough mistakes and learned enough that the, the new generation of CEO, they're way smarter than I was. Uh, and, and they're way more aware because they lived it. They, they lived, you know, they're in their early 20s, <laughs> like I was when I, I started Reddit, but they're, they're coming at it with a much wiser perspective. Are you somebody that you like to build something and then move on to the next thing? Because it seems like you are. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. And then I finally resigned myself to that fact and realized that being an investor, starting a firm where I could invest early, be a true believer before anyone else, help the founders build, but have a portfolio of companies gave me something that I could build long-term wealth and, and sort of legacy with, which is the fund itself. Um, but still satisfy the kind of like ADD of what am I working on today? Oh, it's going to be, it's a, it's a hardware company doing a revolutionary new speaker system, or it's a, a verticalized social network for soccer, like Gloria. Like I, I get the benefit of building a team, building a, a kind of empire, but, but getting to have a different thing on my plate every morning. And it's kind of the best of both worlds. So you're saying these people in the early 20s who are now going to decide everything that happens in the second generation. Mm -hmm. But it's also a generation that, you know, they're, on, they're online a lot. A lot. They're very sensitive. Um, sensitive, yeah. They, uh, the cancel culture piece still seems like it's being worked out and the varying mm -hmm. degrees of... Are you even allowed to make a mistake anymore? If you're a 15 year old kid and you're on a TikTok video and you yep. say one dumb thing, make one some one dumb joke, whatever, is your life over? Like that's it. You can never go online again. How do we how do we navigate some of this stuff over the next two three years? Because it seems like we're at a fever pitch now of people just kind. Of, it's like this gotcha culture that I think people think their their hearts in the right place with it. But at the same time, I also feel like people, especially under 25 and under 20, like you should be allowed to make mistakes and learn from them. Isn't that the whole point of having a life? Yes. I, I So I absolutely agree. And I think uh, the unfortunate answer is I think it doesn't go away until it's a, basically time uh, until there's enough mutually assured destruction of everyone, like part of the disparity here is you have multiple generations from like pre-internet, middle internet, which would be me, yeah. and then like the like we grew up on the internet, and and all of them are now colliding, and and there's I think I think basically everyone has valid points, uh, but we've reached a point where no one's talking anymore. And, and where it's about either scoring points or, or just sort of hating the fact that there are new people who have a platform whose opinion matters. And, and that, like, those, are the extremes, those are my simplifications of the extremes. 
Uh, and so I think there will be a point, right? When, when Gen Z is old and then basically every single person alive has an embarrassing video from high school, including like the, the oldest folks in the retirement homes and all the people who fill the, the Senate and the house and highest levels of business. And once everyone has that mutually assured destruction of like that embarrassing thing from when they were kids, then it goes away. But in the interim, we have this conflict and I, I hope, I don't just hope that we get there. We, we need to get there through more dialogue and more empathy and more understanding now than ever. Cause I think the next 10 years, uh, especially here in the United States are going to be crucial. And, and I'm like, from a societal standpoint, absolutely. Right. We need empathy and understanding more than ever in this country. And at the same time, dude, I, I, as a, as a sort of capitalist businessman, I, I always, I can't escape this fact, which is technology is so drastically shaping our world, right? The, the last year was one of the best years for people plugged into technology and wealth. One of the best. It's, it's shocking how well it has gone. You can see this in the public markets, but you, you, you can see this. At the same time, when it was one of the hardest years for the vast majority of, of working folks, of, of people, and that is not sustainable, but that is a that is foreshadowing for what the next ten years are going to unveil, because technology is this great great multiplier of wealth, of efficiency, of value. If you have access to it, if you have the means to invest in it, if you have all this stuff, and if you don't, you're 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 talking about a much bigger wealth gap in this country. You're talking about way way bigger opportunity gap in this country, and that part is is not healthy for a, a viable uh, republic. Uh, not to get too heavy, but I think. You know, we have at the same time, we have these strong, strong social pressures, which are splitting us and polarizing us. We have these very real economic pressures that are polarizing us. They don't always do so on the same sort of wavelengths. And, uh, and those are two existential threats to, I mean, frankly, the country. And I'm still an optimist. I say this <laughs> very optimistic and hopefully maybe sport can be one of the things that helps, real, helps us realize we have more in common than, than not. Um, but it's, it's important. It, the, these next 10 years are going to be very, very, very important. Well, ironically, Reddit combines a lot of the stuff we're talking about, right? Some of the best stuff and yeah. some of the worst stuff. And you could really feel it the last four or five years. And as basically these alternate universes are, are forming in 2015, 16, and then kind of just coexisting. And how do you police it? How do you stop it? Should you police it? What, what, what are the ramifications of we have freedom of speech in this country telling somebody they can't say or write certain things and, and it just became a mess. And I feel like Reddit was at the forefront of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, all of the, and I, like, I'm no longer affiliated with the company. I did step down pretty publicly in protests last yeah. June. Um, but you know, like as an out from a, a sort of outside perspective now, um, and I've, 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 I've gone off on Twitter about this stuff too. This is, it, it is ultimately up to any private business to decide what they want on the platform and what they don't. Just like it's up to, uh, you know, you know, it, it is the, the, the kinds of policy guidelines a platform wants to set should be in the best interests of, if we're being really capitalist, their shareholders. And I would argue that having a place where people feel safe expressing themselves, a pe place where people feel they can find their home and, and just feel safe, period, is good for business. And so it's good for shareholders. Um, and then they also have to make decisions about just what kind of values they want to have as a company. And, and, and you know, that has an impact, right? The kinds of advertisers they're going to want to be involved, the kinds of users, the kinds of employees. Like There's a lot more stakeholders there beyond shareholders. And I think new generation is going to feel way more confident and comfortable saying this is what we're about and this is what we're not about. And, and I think what, what folks maybe don't realize is the vast, 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 vast majority of people are actually decent people online. Like we're talking about tens of thousands of users who very organized, very motivated, you know, very determined, um, create so much of the toxicity on most of these platforms. And, and so then it's, you know, the question is, I think, you know, these new platforms will understand, look, we want for all those reasons I mentioned, we want to create a great user experience because we want people to feel all those things around community and purpose and belonging. 
And so it's actually in their best business interest to say, look, this is where we, this is where we draw a line. And the reality is though, it is forever going to be a work in progress in the same way that like, you know, technology creates new opportunities. It also creates new risks, deep fakes being the most recent one. I mean, there's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be videos of Bill Simmons saying things that just you literally have never said before, but in a V you probably saw the Tom Cruise ones. This technology is here. It is not going away. There's going to be a new industry created just to have watermarked videos one day, just so that you can basically digitally sign that, yes, I, Bill Simmons, made this video. Mm-hmm. In the same way that like, you can think of it as like, I mean, it seems scary on the, on the, on, at the start, but in the same way that like, if someone doctors a tweet, um, you know, eventually it sort of gets sussed out that, oh, this was Photoshopped because someone else has the actual original tweet or you can, there, there's like a proof of record so that, you know, the world is not rife with fake Photoshop tweets and they exist, but there's not like billions of them because we've, our sort of immune system has learned that we need to see some more proof. It'll be the same thing with deep fakes and these videos that look really, really real, uh, but are totally artificially generated through AI. Um, and it's an arms race. And, and I'm, you know, there's lots of, there are, there is value to creating things like that. Uh, one way or another, the technology is not stopping because uh, someone's going to, someone's going to create it somewhere. And then it's on, it's on the entrepreneurs, it's on creators, it's on platforms to decide, okay, what are the things we're doing to protect our users? What are the things we can build to, to make better alternatives? Um, but like I said, that's why I said the next 10 years are going to be very important to get right. Uh, because we already see the prevalence of fake news using pretty low tech technology, and it's effective. Uh, so, what happens when it gets you know uh, much, much, much better? Do you think the internet? You think it should have? It should almost be like a driver's license. If you go on the internet, <laughs> you have to apply. Like, because you could argue you could do just as much damage on the internet as you could behind the wheel of a car, right? And, yeah. <laughs> and we're so careful about, like, I'm going through it now with my daughter. You'll go through it someday. Mm-hmm. Oh, my yeah. daughter's 15 and a half. Mm-hmm. Now she's, she's driving us around cause she's got her permit and it's by the way, mm-hmm. completely terrifying, harrowing, pick a word. It's the worst. Yeah, um, right. but mm-hmm. there's this whole process before she's allowed to drive. And I wonder like, maybe the internet should work this way. Maybe there should be a footprint for everybody. And maybe that's the solution for this. I don't think it'll ever happen. But it's it's hard to see the downside of it. It will. It would probably have. It would okay. It would definitely not hurt. You know, there are still plenty of people who have driver's licenses who are terrible, irresponsible, reckless drivers who you know cause problems. So it's not going to solve things. But that's that's not sure. reason. But I think so. Without a doubt, media literacy should be a part of the education of every kid like formalize it. I think personal finance is another one that's like borderline criminal that we don't teach young people because then as soon as they're 18, it's like, would you like a credit card? And it's like, well, well, wait, wait, there's a lot of people who are making a lot of money thanks to the fact that you have a population that doesn't have like exposure to personal finance at a young age. So or, put, or school I'm, loans, yeah. same thing. Oh, a hundred percent. Hey, lo- yeah, you go to college, you just pay later. Okay, cool. Yeah, good deal. Yeah. Oh, a hundred. And, and so where that comes from, I mean, gosh, they, they, you know, there's a long list of things that we need in terms of education reform. So I can't give you a really pragmatic answer because I, I don't know how that change comes. But I would, I would say media literacy needs to be a part of every child's education, whether it's the parents doing it. I'm sure there's probably some startups pitching some version of it, uh, but that's, that's going to be important. Now, it goes the other way, though. You still have a population of... Uh, I'm going to avoid the OK Boomer meme. But you have a population of boomers who are you know, notorious for sharing misinformation on social media. They're the biggest... They're actually the most likely, based on some, I guess, fairly rigorous studies, to, to share fake news or misinformation because they, you know, they came up in an era where, yeah, you trusted the one of a handful of trusted sources for news. And so if something shows up in your newsfeed, it's probably true. Why ask? Um, so what do you do there? Um, it's... Look, there's... There's a lot, a lot that's going to be changing these next uh, 10 years. And I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to do my best to make sure that I'm, I'm helping build the things that are a part of the, the positive. I got two speed round questions for you. Okay. Um, we talk about trading cards. All right. We'll do, let's do trading cards now then. Yeah. It's so I, I've had like a whole 
long history with it. And then like a lot of people um, reignited yet again during the pandemic, but it's been astonishing to watch. I had to get cards out of my house and put them in safety deposit boxes because yes, things cool. were like tripling and quadrupling and quintupling. I was like, oh my God. And yeah. it doesn't seem like it's going away. And it ties into a lot of, you know, stuff that's just happening in the country right now where gambling, speculation, mm -hmm. um, hedge fund type stuff, people just liking to bet on assets and hoping it turns out. And then foreign money coming in, rich people coming in, trying to push the market. So where, how long have you been in it? And did you, uh, did it increase? I, I'm doing okay. I have a, I collected, you know, as a kid in the nineties. So most of that collection is pretty worthless. Even though I was, I was the dork who kept it in mint condition. And like, I wasn't wearing gloves back then, but I was still pretty OCD and I never let my friends touch my cards or anything like that. I was a really fun kid. And, and then I came back around maybe a year and a half ago because a buddy of mine, uh, a guy much smarter than me, was like, hey, man, I got back into card collecting lately. You should really check it out. And I was like, wait, what? Trading cards? That's a thing now? And he, he turns me on to a couple of forums and there's some, there's some communities on Reddit too. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh man, this reminds me, like 2012, I stumble into the Bitcoin community on Reddit. And I'm like, this is cooking. Like, There's a lot of smart people. I, I, I don't quite believe that this will become what they think it will because at the time it was very like this is going to you know be the formation of a new digital first society but i was like all right let's get in this a little bit I ended up investing in coinbase um back in like 2014 so that's that's turning out pretty well we'll see how the the ipo goes but um now flash back to a couple of years ago and i'm like okay i understand what this is I, I, I don't need to read a white paper. Like I get it. I collected these things. This is a new type of like contemporary art because it's culture, right? Sport is culture and it's a scarce, scarce asset. There's only a few. They're beautiful. I mean, some are more beautiful than others and they have value. And, and so I started dipping in and then like a good husband, I'm like, I got to start, I got to start buying my wife's cards. Uh, oh, and I, this is great. Which one? I forget. What's her rookie card? It's so, like 2000 range. So there's a 2003 net pro. They did a whole series. That's actually those, those kits were very valuable to pick up or cause if, even if you get the, the, the packs or the, the boxes, because it was Rafa's rookie card, Rogers rookie card and Serena and Venus's. And, wow. um, and so that net, there's a bunch of different net pro series. They kind of created like glossy and these international different versions, but that's arguably the rookie. She has a sports illustrated kids card from, was uh, 98, I think is, uh, is a, is that one is kind of like the true one, but it's like a really thin paper. So that one's been, it's harder to get in a uh, gem mint grade, but I started collecting cause sure enough, you know, tennis cards were back then notorious, like just ridiculously undervalued because who was collecting? No one was like collecting tennis cards, right? They couldn't give those things away. I'm sure. And then women's tennis cards are Serena's and, and, and Venus as well were, were just ridiculously undervalued. So I just started buying as many as I could. And, and I'm buying, I'm buying, I'm buying. And I'm, sh I'm giving them to my wife. And she's like, uh, can you just get me like a purse next time? Or <laughs> some jewelry? And I'm like, nah, babe, this is a gift. This is an investment. Trust me. Like, trust me. And she's like, okay, weirdo. Because for, for the athletes, I don't know if there's other athletes, but like for her, she's just like, okay, like, mm, I guess the trading card like, is kind of weird that you're giving me, but okay. And, and I, and I said, no, you don't understand. Like this is, this is like investing in Serena Williams stock. Like this is going to change everything because a new generation of athletes coming up now understands that they're more than just an athlete. They know they're building a community and a following and all these other businesses. And yeah, they can create a Delaware C Corp and invest in that literally. But the other way to invest really in themselves is having these, you know, vaulted, uh, because whether they're having success on the court or off, it's going up in in value, right? It's they, like they when up. Floyd Mayweather used to bet on himself before yeah. fights. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, but 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 totally legal and ethical. <laughs> yeah, and and that's like that is a powerful sea change. And and then once she started seeing the prices going up, she was like, "Okay, this was a good gift. Thanks." Uh, and so I, you know, I I become this obsessive collector. Um, and also was, you know, buying into, I, I, I'm, I'm very big on the culture um, and, and sort of that long-term value because I'm, I'm an early stage investor. So I want to buy early and undervalued and, and really help it grow to long-term. So I've got a ton of like uh, 
uh, like Alex Morgan cards, Megan Rapino cards. I mean, I do have uh, a women's football club in Angel City FC, um, but I also know like these women are tremendously undervalued. And you know, if if I believe this eventually gets to be as easy as buying and selling stocks, then think of all the cultural value, especially women athletes have. Right, the, those women I just named are icons who have transcended their sport. If you give the population access, that's as easy as buying and selling shares. Half the population are women um, who are basically being left out of most of this. Ms. Industry right now is very male dominated. Um, I think when you start to see more efficiency, you're going to see way more movement even there. And uh, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a, a hodl guy from coin uh, from a Bitcoin terminology. I'm, I'm definitely holding for the long term and. And then this CEO I knew, Lior, says, Hey, man, I've been collecting too. Uh, and I'm actually trying to build a platform to make it as easy to buy and sell trading cards as it is to buy and sell stocks. And eventually we do all kinds of alternative assets. And I was like, Say no more. I need to invest. I need to lead this round. And you know, we ended up leading their Series A and the company was Alt. Uh, we launched uh, last week. And so, you know, I didn't want to manage my portfolio in a spreadsheet anymore. So I just manage it on Alt. And I didn't want to have to. Explain to my wife why there were all these cards in our, in my closet, uh, and so now they're vaulting them uh, for me. So uh, it's it's the very start of building this marketplace, and I'm I'm excited, man. This is it's a reflection of the shift that is happening, and you saw it a little bit with GameStop and Wall Street bets. Uh, you saw it with crypto. Um, you're seeing with NFTs. Um, you know. Gen Z, or let's just say digital natives in particular, are seeing zero percent interest rates. So you put your, or near zero. So you put your money in the bank, you're not going to make any money on savings. They're understanding now that financial literacy has increased, that as long as the Fed is printing money and you know, keeps dumping money into the system, inflation is going to probably keep going up and interest rates are going to probably stay low. So where do you make money? Because if you keep in the bank, keep in the savings account, you're not only not making money on interest, it's losing value. As, as the currency is getting inflated. And so I think that's given rise to all these alternative assets or all these alternative investments. And, and in particular, you know, now they realize like, okay, well, what are rich people during this, doing during this time? Like they're investing in things that have higher yields of return, like alternative assets, like art, for instance. So, okay, I want a taste of that too. Why not? And just in the same way, we've seen buying and selling stocks gotten, you know, have to call up your broker. Uh, you just do it with a couple of taps. You're combining a generation that is digitally native and understands great user interfaces and is motivated enough to just do it themselves with uh, a feeling of distrust around institutions where they're like, well, if, it, you know, if it's good enough for them, it should be good enough for me too. Um, and you, you, you start looking at the pieces of that. Like you brought up student loan debt. A whole generation told work hard, get good grades, go to college. Don't worry about that student loan debt. You're going to have a great job after. Who are looking around going, okay, wait, I did all the things you told me for all those years. I did what you said. And now I have a ton of student loan debt and I don't have that, that job that I was told and, and that I had worked so hard toward. And it feels like a bum deal. And, and so I think you combine that with the financial crisis and banks getting bailed out and average Americans fitting the bill and, and it layers. And, and then you, you democratize access with technology. And I think this is just the start, man. You brought up sports betting. It's um, it's finally taken hold here in the U.S. and it's been and good for us. Yeah, I mean, it's it's wild because you know the states are certainly motivated after COVID now because it's it's additional revenue for them. Selfishly, I think that's going to help drive a lot of it. They're gonna they're just going to want the the tax revenue, the additional revenue. And then as you see that evolve, it's like one part of it is you scratch your itch actually betting on the game, and then. You also scratch your itch making the sort of long term investment. Like, don't, don't just bet on KD for the game, bet on him for his career uh, by investing in the asset, by investing in sort of him through the, the cards. And, and I'm curious to see where this goes. But there was a, I don't know, there, there was definitely a moment in, I think it was a game three post, it was a post game. Con uh, press conference where LeBron was talking in the, in the bubble finals where he was asked about the card that had sold for like 1.8. And actually Lior, who, who founded Alt, was the guy who bought it, uh, interestingly enough. But LeBron gets asked about it and he's like, yeah, you know, it's it crazy. It's a lot of money. 
you know, when I was growing up, I never could have imagined, you know, a trading card being worth that much. But um, I know I have two in my safe. So no matter what, my family is going to be good or something like that. And I felt like this is a turning point because I, I really believe for this new generation coming up of, of athletes, they're thinking of themselves the same way as that new generation of, of the YouTubers, of content creators, of podcasters. Like they know what their business is, is more than just specifically what they do. They have to be multifaceted. They have to build a community. They have to be thinking for the long term. And, and I just see this. I just see it continuing to grow. And, and it took my dad six years to buy his first Bitcoin. And I was like, Dad, we invested in Coinbase in 2012 or 2013, 2014. I was like, Dad, come on, buy, please buy some Bitcoin. Please buy some Bitcoin. Never did. Uh, convincing him the value of like the 86 Fleer Jordan rookie card, much easier, yeah, <laughs> much yeah. easier. Uh, and I think that's a huge, huge shift that we're, we're only starting to see. And I don't know, I hope, I hope you've got, uh, I hope you've got them graded, Bill. And then properly vaulted. If not, we can help with that. No, it's a PSA. I was the only child. Of course, I was going to collect cards. But in the eighties, they didn't have the PSA stuff. So you buy, you'd go to the card shows. You would actually really study the card and try to make sure it was truly mint. Oh my and then God. things really changed. eBay was the the second wave, and yes. oh two oh three ran I, earlier than that. Two thousand two thousand one. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of fraud back then, but there was also some good opportunity and great deals. And then. I, it's funny you mentioned it was a male dominated in industry. Um, that's an understatement. We used to go to the collector <laughs> convention every year. It was yeah. all guys. You you might yeah. see six women out of two thousand people at yeah. the collectors thing. So I'll be interested to see if you're right about Dude, uh, more females. Well, look, I I I think about this based on mimetic strength, and and I I've, I'm fond of saying every business yeah. name has to be a meme, and not just like. Not like a meme, like the image memes we think about that are just silly gifts or whatever, but like it needs to be mimetic. It needs to be something that people want to share because it's so unique, because it's so creative, it's so funny, it's something. And you're seeing this across the board on the internet. The way to build an audience and get attention is through mimetic growth, something that people just really want to talk about and share and build community around. And that's value, right? What's the, the reason the game stopped? stock, and this is not financial advice, <laughs> is worth what it is, is because a bunch of people believe in it being worth that because it has this mimetic value where they can't help but talk to one another about it or, or literally make memes about it. And so markets are only going to get more and more driven by this reality because community and capital have never been able to interplay in real time at this scale before because now millions of people can coordinate with a tweet or with a post or with whatever and actually move dollars. And those you know, maybe a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, but in aggregate, that is a lot of money. That's enough to nearly kill, uh, was it Melvin Capital, right? And a, a big time uh, hedge fund. And this is just, these are early innings. And so the reason I bet on the mimetic strength of these athletes and particularly women athletes is that you just need to look at the energy and the attention and the interest when they sort of go viral when they like every like you may have never watched an NWSL match but you've probably got the Megan Rapino pose in your head right after that goal you may hate Megan Rapino and you still know that pose you may love Rapino and I definitely know you know that you love that pose that is mimetic strength you can't pay for right Alex Morgan sipping a tea on England like there is there is community built around that and and the idea that you could put dollars behind it as a fan. And if you believe that other people in your tribe believe in this player and their long-term strength too, that they'll put money into and then it keeps going up and then it reinforces that. I think it's, I think we're going to look back on it as, as one of the sort of most obvious in hindsight investments. This is why, this is why I invested in Angel City. Like out the gate, this team has brand partnerships with amazing companies like DoorDash is our main kit sponsor. They set records for that kit deal not just for the NWSL, but like records around women's pro sports, because there's been this latent energy, this hunger. Brands want to be associated with it. Fans want to be associated with it. It just wasn't given it sort of its equal due. And, um, and so I'm excited to see what happens now that we invest with the same fervor and excitement and energy um, because that leveling of the playing field, I mean, look, just in the same way, when if, if Serena's not in the US Open, those ratings, those ratings go down. 
right? There is a lack of interest. There's lack of energy that has value. And today we only calculate that value based on maybe some what decrease in like ticket sales and decrease in viewer dollars and ad dollars. That's a small part of the story. And, and I'm, I'm very excited to see it because I look, I want, should my daughter want to play sports? You, you better believe I want her to be paid just as much as her male counterparts. And you better believe I want to see the next call it 15 years of work. Um, helping supply meet demand, helping the market actually be more efficient to show just how valuable these women are. And, and with women's soccer in particular, I mean, these women are literally the best in the world and they have been year after year after year. And the average American can't tell you too many MLS players, no disrespect to the MLS, can't tell you, but they can tell you about Alex, they can tell you about Megan. And that means cultural value. That means importance. And, and I think once, I think Americans... We love greatness and we love excellence. And, and I think we have a huge opportunity to introduce them to soccer where they don't really have, I mean, unless you're really paying attention overseas, you're not really paying attention to soccer day to day as a sports fan here in the US because there's so much competition, right? It's a huge white space for, for us. And I say that with no disrespect to MLS, they've grown by leaps and bounds and they're <laughs> doing very well. Um, but I do think long term, it's on the women's side because. And frankly, for a lot of Americans, soccer is a sport like played by women, right? That is the stereotype. And, and part of that is just because our women have been so damn dominant and good. Uh, and the men, uh, not so much. I could, uh, you have to go, but I, I could do 20 minutes on the disparity with just living through it with my daughter, like how boys teams are treated versus the girls yes. teams. So, but that's, it's bad. But just maybe 15 years from now, it'll be better. Uh, we got three. You, we got to get you in a team. We need to get you to be a, are you allowed to be an owner in a, in a New England uh, women's football club? <laughs> sure. We cook something. All right. All right. Um, yeah. T- talk to me after. Oh, wait, right. three speed round questions for you. And then wait. we have to go. Okay. These are quick, quick answers. All right. All right. I'll try. Do you ever get used to actually dating a famous person, being out in public with somebody who's actually legitimately famous? Oh, because the internet guy is not famous? Yeah, no. No, I, no, I'm saying like just, just being out in public at a restaurant when all the eyes stop and they're just staring at her. Do you ever get used I, to it? I, not at all. I'll never get used to it. And I still, I mean, I got to puff up my chest and get in front of guys who like come over to the table just to say hi. And I'm like, dude, I'm on a, like, I'm on a date with my wife here. I had this happen during her anniversary. And I almost, I mean, I had words with this guy because I'm just like, you need to just walk away, dude. And he had a few drinks in him and he gets confident and comes over. And I'm just like, I'm trying to have an anniversary yeah. dinner with my wife here. So no, I don't get used to it. And I'm, I'm, yeah. All right. I mean, second dude. question. All right. Did you, did you study other, uh, other spouses, girlfriends, boyfriends <laughs> of people sitting in the box and how they reacted <laughs> after big points and big games to their famous tennis player partner? I, um, I did not. Did not. And, okay. and and what's good is if your research team looks on YouTube, they'll find clips of me at uh, DC football games, like screaming. Uh, I get reckless at sporting events, right? And I've I've made it on ESPN years ago for my antics. I can't bring any of that to tennis, which sucks because you're you're supposed to you know be restrained in between points and stuff. And so grandmother, uh, my mother in law, Serena's mom. Or seen. She was the one who coached me. And so if I got too loud or something, she'd give me a look and I'd be like, okay, all right, noted. This is not the right time to cheer. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's all the coaching I needed. I think the goat for uh, box reactions was Pete Sampras's wife, Brigitte Wilson Sampras, the actress. She was just great. She was oh, she's, great. A, she's a professional. All yeah. Right. You, you might have to oh, study, study some of her YouTube. See, see some of the tricks she had. Uh, uh, okay. Last Wait, question. How, how tall are you? Six foot five. Okay, so here's my theory, and then we can end on this. Okay. I think the athletic genes come from the mom. Mm. I'm not saying 100, percent but so. I really I think it's like 75 to 80. But the dad still mm. needs to throw something in, whether it's height, yeah. maybe maybe some muscle, hand eye stuff like that. Yeah. I just have high hopes for your daughter. I'm just I'm monitoring it. If there were rookie cards for your daughter. I'm I'm buying them now. I, I appreciate that, Bill. You'll know they'll be you, you won't miss it. That first run of Olympia handing rookie cards will, will be out there. <laughs> Uh, one of these days. I, I am very hopeful and I can tell so far she's inherited all of her mom's best qualities, including her athleticism, which we're all grateful for. Um, she does look like she's getting my height though because she's, she's already like three, three and a half feet tall. She's a tall, she's like 98th, 99th percentile. Um, and so Papa Bear definitely brought some height in. So I think it'll help her with the serves, you know, but again, no pressure. 
no pressure, whatever she wants to do. Well, she could zag on you. Like Agassi and Steffi Graf's kid was, was yeah. what, a hockey player or a baseball player? Oh, all right. Yeah. All right. She could still be, she could be an engineer and a CEO and a startup founder too. I'll be very happy. We'll be happy no matter what. But. All right, I'm monitoring. I'm monitoring the rookie card. So I'll start searching yep. on eBay That's in about eight wrong. years. <laughs> you, won't, you won't be able to miss it though. And I'll, I'll get you one. I'll get you one. Of the first All right. Days. Appreciate it. Thanks for yeah. coming on. This is fun. Uh, this is cool. I've, yeah. I've wanted to be on for a minute and uh, very, very happy to be on here. All right, so, cool. Best of luck with everything. Thanks, Bill.